All right, I'm Sarah, and uh, I'll be talking about uh, our work on explainable AI. In particular, grounding deep models of visual data. This is my awesome team of collaborators. Together, we try to explain uh, why deep models make certain decisions. So deep models have become state of the art for many, many um, tasks nowadays. And we'd like to know why exactly these models make such decisions. In particular, we're interested in the visual modality that means an input of images or videos. So as AI systems are becoming integrated into crucial applications, it's becoming crucial to explain why they make certain decisions. And it may be obvious why we would like to explain um, an incorrect decision or why a model makes a mistake, but it's actually equally important to be able to explain why the model makes a correct decision. So one of the important actions to be detected in vision systems of autonomous vehicles is pedestrian crossing. So if you assume that you are programming a, some vision system for an autonomous vehicle, you would like to be able to predict the action pedestrian crossing. You'd like to be able to predict that there are pedestrians crossing the road uh, at a certain point. Now assume that the system you're training is capable of achieving about 99.9% .9 accuracy. And the question now becomes, is this system ready to be deployed? or do we still need to do more work? And our take on this is we think we really need to do more work because what if in the example I, I, I showed, what if the system that is capable of you know, obtaining a very high accuracy only models the periodic motion of the legs of the humans performing the pedestrian crossing in whatever challenging data set we have at the company? If the pedestrians look like this, the system will completely fail because the legs are completely occluded and this periodic motion cannot be predicted anymore. So in our work, we ground the evidence of a model's decision. So we try to see why the model makes a specific prediction. And then we try to use this grounding to further improve the models. So I'll start by giving some motivations on spatial grounding, which is grounding in the image space. So how do we know why our model makes a decision like this? So this is an example frame from one of the videos we have uh, that we tested on our models. The ground truth for this frame is baby crawling. However, our system decided to classify this frame as push-ups, okay? So the question becomes why. It's very interesting because the pose of the baby is actually very similar to the pose of a person who would be performing um, uh, the, the push-ups action. So, but we cannot tell for sure if it's the pose that made the network actually classify this uh, as a push-ups action. But if we use grounding, then we probably can start explaining uh, such questions, the answers to such questions. So let's take a look at this input image and let's uh, take a sample of what we call grounding. Uh, so this input image has a zebra and an elephant. And so what we can do with spatial grounding techniques is we can ask why, wh we can ask the network, why would you classify this as a zebra? And this is uh, example output. And why would you classify this image as an elephant? And this is sample output. So this is sort of discriminative, uh, a discriminative highlight of why a network would make a specific decision for an image. So this is a, another example application where you can actually highlight things that are not in the ground truth. So on the, the, the leftmost image is an image of, a, um, uh, of someone's face. And this is in an emotion recognition data set where we, you'd like to detect if someone's face you know, looks happy or angry or sad and so on. And the ground truth label for this image is actually happy. So what we can do, uh, in the middle we highlight why the network thinks this image is a happy image, but we could also highlight other classes that are not necessarily the ground, the ground truth label. So we can say why, why do you think this image is neutral and in this case uh, it highlights the nose. So it has learned that the nose doesn't really contribute to uh, much to most of the uh, facial expressions. We also use spatial grounding to visualize different training modalities. So if we train in different ways, how, how does the network shift its focus from certain locations and images to other locations? So on the leftmost, we have an image of an airplane in a somewhat cluttered scene. And we apply classification. So we train on some graphics images, like a different domain, and then we test on these real images. So this is a domain transfer problem. In the middle, we show the example of the network that was not trained using domain adaptation, and this is what it focuses on. So it focuses on some metallic part of the, uh, of the airplane. 
And then after we perform domain adaptation, the image is actually correctly classified. And now the focus is on the wings on the, of the airplane, which is a more discriminative feature, if you like, uh, to classify this uh, object as an airplane. So we use the formulation of Zhang et al. for, 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 the, for this demo uh, of how we uh, perform the spatial grounding. It's a probabilistically interpretable approach where you uh, normalize a probability distribution at every level of the network. In this case, J is closer to the classification layer and I is a shallower layer. I'll now show you how we extend this to videos. So assume we have an input video. So at the top left, we have a video where we have a person performing a diving action. Let's see if we can. So there's a person performing a diving action, and this is in the middle of another action, which is horse riding. Uh, and what we do here in order to perform this spatiotemporal grounding or grounding, we would like to basically see a highlight in both space and time. So we'd like to see where exactly the person is diving on the frame spatially, but then we also want to see where the person started diving in the video and at which point the person uh, completed the dive. And so what we do is we edit the backward pass. So we use a recurrent model because in this case a video is spatiotemporal and so we use a convolutional neural network followed by uh, an LSTM. The forward pass is unaltered. What we altered is the block, the, the dashed block. And so we alter the backward pass by saying we would like to you know, highlight uh, the specific action diving. This is how our model looks like in the forward pass. We then would like to perform this backward propagation. Now, because we are using this probabilistically interpretable approach, we need to keep our values as normalized probabilities. However, LSTMs uh, almost always uh, have the, the 10Hs, meaning that they have some negative activations as well. So we, uh, we used an LSTM with uh, a ReLU instead to make sure we are maintaining the probability distribution. Now we backpropagate in both space and time, and we stop at some convolutional layer in the middle of the, uh, of the CNN to get our uh, maps. We'd like to get some discriminative maps. So in the example I showed for the zebra and the elephant, we wanted the neurons that specifically fire for zebra and the neurons that specifically fire for elephant, but not the neurons that are general and just fire for any animal. So the way we do this is we backpropagate for diving, we find maps for diving, and then we repeat the process, but now we would like to see the evidence of non-diving, and the way we do this is by switching the hyperplane, so we negate all the weights at the classification layer, and we perform the backpropagation again. We then subtract the non-diving evidence from the diving evidence, and in that case, we get discriminative maps for the action diving. This is the sample output. So the first three frames here show an example of a person diving. You can see the heat maps. Uh, they're covering the person performing the cliff diving action, uh, followed by the horse riding action. And this is a sample video. So the same video is gonna play on the left and on the right. Uh, on the left, we're gonna be highlighting the action handstand walking, and then on the right, we'll be highlighting the action uh, ice dancing. So we were first to formulate the top-down top saliency and deep recurrent models for space-time grounding of videos. And we, we do so, so these videos are a result of only a single contrastive um, partial backpropagation using excitation backprop. Um, and what we found was really interesting here is that although we're not really directly optimizing for localization, we are getting some coarse localization for free. So all the models I've shown you were models that were trained for classification. So we show it many, many examples of cliff diving and many, many examples of horse riding. And that's the only information we give. We never optimize by saying this is the where, where cliff diving starts and this is where cliff diving ends. We do not uh, supervise in this regard. However, when we compare our um, performance, whoops, 
when we compare our performance to other supervised uh, methods, we uh, obtain uh, quite similar results, which we found interesting. But this is only at coarse localization. So uh, in this case, we show an example of an overlap alpha of only 0.1. We also explore grounding in um, image captioning. So on the very left, we see an image. And we have a captioning model, again, a CNN LSTM LSTM model. And the caption produced for this image by our model is a man in a lab coat is working on a microscope. And so we ask the model, why did you decide to predict the word man? And in the second image, you can see that the so red means uh, this is the most salient region. And so the red part uh, is on the person's head. And then we ask the model, why did you decide to predict the word working? And it sort of highlights the bench area. And then why did you think um, there's a microscope? And it highlights the microscope. So in our paper, we also show some localization results. All right. Now that we know how to sort of ground, both in space and time, so we can visually see what the evidence is, uh, upon which a model is making a decision, how can we now use this evidence to further improve networks? So in this work, what we do is we, um, we alter the training process by introducing a new regularizer called excitation dropout, which is a variant of the widely uh, used regularizer dropout. The difference here is that well, now we're not going to just drop out a randomly selected set of neurons, but we will drop out the neurons that are relevant or that are most relevant for a specific prediction. So in this example, we have an image of a person riding a horse. And so if the classification uh, class is horse and it highlights the horse region, what we're going to do is we're going to drop out the neurons that are responsible for this prediction that basically highlight the horse. And by doing this, we are forcing the network to learn alternative paths in order to come up with the same conclusion. So we're kind of enforcing some plasticity-like behaviors, which is also um, available in uh, human brains. So the orange block there is the binary mask. So we select the neurons, for example, the light neurons are going to be the ones responsible, and so we'll decide to um, block these neurons. So we show that even using very shallow networks that only have two convolutional layers, we can get a performance that is a lot higher than uh, other state-of-the-art dropout techniques. So a purple curve is ours on four data sets. And then what's also interesting about learning these alternative paths is that now there's a lot of redundancy in the network, so we are using more and more of the network's capacity. And so in this case, we can actually compress the network um, quite a lot before we uh, lose our performance. So in this example, on the x-axis, as we move along the x-axis, we're dropping more and more neurons in the compression uh, phase. And so as you can see, the um, purple, uh, the, so the three colored curves are curriculum dropout, which is state of the art. Um, standard dropout and no dropout, and this is what happens when you come to compress the network, but then when you learn these alternative paths, you have the purple curve and you're a lot more resilient to compression. So the works I've shown here were um, IJCV, CVPR, and this latest work is currently on uh, archive. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.